Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Brad Antle. I'm the chair of MVTC Impact AI Summit and the executive chairman of OSEAS Networks. On behalf of my co-chairs, Charles Onstop III from SEIC and Tom Otecki from Virginia Tech, welcome to MVTC's Impact AI Summit. We're delighted that all of you have joined us for day three of the MVTC Impact AI Summit. MVTC is our trade association representing the Capital Region's tech community. We unite, educate, and advocate for our members to advance a thriving tech ecosystem where we live and work. This region offers a unique set of artificial intelligence assets that no other region in the world can match. Fortune 1000 companies, entrepreneurs, investors, proximity to and expertise in serving the federal government customer, a highly educated workforce, an unparalleled research infrastructure and, tech, and top academic talent. This ecosystem is dedicated to developing innovative AI solutions for both commercial and public sector customers. That's what we're here today to explore and highlight. We have a very exciting program for you today, but before we invite our first speaker to the screen, I want to thank the companies and individuals who have made today's summit possible through their financial sponsorship and also their guidance and expertise as members of our event steering committee. Our platinum sponsor is Accenture. Our gold sponsor, Ericsson Immigration Group. Keynote and panel sponsors, Digital Realty, Dovell Technologies, SAIC. Our silver sponsor, Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. Our program sponsor, George Mason University. Our PR and marketing advisor, the Merritt Group. Our public policy advisor, Hunt and Andrews Kurt. Our marketing agency advisor, O2KL. Our and our media partners, iHeartMedia, Scoop News Group, and Washington Technology. All of these sponsors have made their, the content today possible with their generous support and guidance. I would also like to thank NVTC's business partners and academic partners for their year-long support of NVTC. They are Booz Allen Hamilton, Center for Innovative Technology, Consumer Technology Association, Dell Tech, Dominion Energy, George Mason University, Innova, KPMG, Maximus, Microsoft, Noblis, Northrop Grumman, PenFed, Pillsbury, PNC Bank, SAIC, Venable, Verizon, and Virginia Tech. A quick reminder for anyone who wants to tweet from today's event, we'll be using the hashtag ImpactAI. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we will have a Q&A session with our speakers that will be open to any of the subjects that were presented today. And we'll try our best to get through as many questions as we can in the time available. Please use the question button at the right side of your screen to post your questions throughout the presentation. Please identify the speakers your question uh, is for and don't wait until the end. Now let's get things started. To kick off our program, I'm delighted to introduce you to Dave, Dave P from Digital Realty to introduce today's first keynote speaker, Dr. Malek Ben Salem. Thank you, Brad. I'm delighted to be here today to introduce Dr. Malek Ben Salem and Digital Realty. But first, let me say a few words about Digital Realty. Digital Realty provides a trusted foundation for scaling digital business and home for hybrid IT. The most important currency exchange between enterprises and their customers is digital trust. As the ongoing surge of information accelerates, so does the need for secure data exchange across the world. Established in 2004, Digital Realty Trust is built on the foundation of digital trust with the core values driven by the customer centricity, excellence, and teamwork. Digital Realty is the largest global provider of multi-tenant data center capacity by square footage and supports the hybrid IT architecture and interconnection strategies for over 4,000 customers across the world. Our global platform named Platform Digital 
comprises of more than 275 data centers, 24 countries, 47 metros across six continents. Dr. Malek Ben Salem is a technology executive with more than 20 years experience and a principal director for cloud, data, and AI security at Accenture. She is an accomplished technology leader with proven success in AI and cybersecurity research and innovation. She advises organizations on boards and on building innovative products and offerings and on achieving real risk reduction. She is deeply skilled in technology strategy, leadership, C-suite collaboration, risk management, business development, and much more. Please welcome Dr. Malik Ben Salem. Thank you, Dave, for the introduction. Thanks to the Northern Virginia Technology Council for inviting me to speak on AI's impact on cybersecurity today. As AI moves or breaks into the uh, mainstream, there's a great deal of confusion and disinformation about what it's capable of and uh, all the potential risks that it poses. This is also true for the cybersecurity field. So my talk today will focus on all of the applications and all of the problems that AI can help us solve in cybersecurity. But I also will talk about how it could be weaponized and how it's being weaponized by cyber adversaries to conduct more and more complex cyber attacks. I will also cover how AI introduces a new threat and a new attack surface in, uh, into our networks and into our organizations. And finally, I would like to talk about how we can build and operate AI that is secure, safe, robust, and trustworthy overall. So to start with the AI opportunities, I'd like to first uh, cover some of the current threats, threat trends, sorry, within the cybersecurity field that are calling for a new paradigm, a new paradigm that uses AI to solve cybersecurity problems. The first trend is the skill shortage that we suffer from in this field. According to cybersecurity ventures, about 3.5 million jobs uh, will go unfilled in 2021 because we cannot find the right talent uh, with the right cybersecurity background. Another trend is the rising costs of cybercrime. Cybercrime cost the world about $1 trillion in 2020. That's a 50% increase from 2018. So in order to counter or to fight that cybercrime, we need all the automation and all the intelligence in the world. The, threat, the third threat, uh, trend sorry, are the number of new zero days discovered every day or every year. A zero day is a security flaw for which the vendor of the flawed system has not uh, published or created a patch yet. In 2020, there were over 18,000 zero days or new vulnerabilities discovered. So to mitigate against those uh, vulnerabilities, we definitely need AI support. Threat intelligence is another trend. About 60% of companies uh, and organizations subscribed to commercial threat intelligence services in 2018. Now, threat intelligence services provide those companies with information about threat actors, about new vulnerabilities, um, you know, all kinds of research that they can gather either from telemetrics of their network or also from the dark web. And a lot of that information comes in unstructured format, in text, and it may come in English, it may come in other languages. So we definitely need artificial intelligence to support us with the analysis of that threat information, to support us with contextualizing that information and tailoring it to the individual organizations so that we can prioritize the threats, et cetera. For that, we need uh, natural la language processing tools. 
So definitely AI will have a place in that market. And then the last trend I'd like to talk about is this proliferation of IoT devices, of connected things. Uh, in 2020 alone, oh, Gartner uh, estimated that the number of uh, devices that got connected last year was about 21 billion devices. Uh, we know that these, the vast majority of these devices are unsecured. Uh, because of the race uh, by the designers of these devices and the manufacturers of these devices to bring them to the market. So we know that they're unsecured. We also know that they have been used to launch a number of attacks, mainly DDoS accounts against major uh, companies. Um, so all of these trends together call for the uh, more advanced use of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity. And uh, to discuss where exactly we can use AI, um, there's a number or wide range of applications, digital identity being one. Organizations can model user behavior to um, and, and use that behavior to authenticate users. Um, the reason the reason we need that is because our uh, today's way of authenticating users is a for, for the most part relies on passwords. And we know that passwords can be stolen, they can be uh, cracked. Uh, there are you know, open source tools that are available for attackers to uh, crack passwords. So we need a second way of authenticating users and a user behavior could be one uh, we could use it to build a historical profile of the user and then check whether there are deviations from that behavior and use that deviation to indicate that, um, you know, credentials have been taken over by an attacker or that somebody is masquerading as the, um, the authenticated user. Um, that's one approach and that's one area where we can definitely use AI to support us. Another area is in risk assessment. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, threat intelligence services could use more and more AI. Uh, that could be also used for uh, risk scoring or assessing the posture, the risk posture of an organization. A third area is email security. Uh, this is an area where we have, uh, you know, used AI before. Um, obviously, email is the, um, you know, the probably the most uh, or the primary delivery technique for malicious files and uh, malicious attachments. Um, email uh, service providers have used AI to detect spam before, and they're currently using it to detect uh, phishing attacks. Uh, but as we see more and more spear phishing attacks that are much more complex and much more targeted, we need to, uh, to use AI and improve the models, the machine learning models uh, that are used to detect the spear phishing attacks in email security. Data protection is one more application of AI, particularly data classification. Uh, within organizations, the way we communicate today is mostly through email uh, or uh, through business documents, right? That's how we capture intellectual property within an organization. That's how we share um, intellectual property and, and sensitive information. And all of those documents have to be protected with the right uh, security controls and access controls. But we need to protect what is sensitive, what is highly confidential, what's confidential. Uh, and therefore, we need to classify these documents as, as such, right, as highly confidential, as restricted or unrestricted. The way we do it today is by relying on the document owner or the document author to label the document uh, accordingly. Um, but relying on the user, um, you know, is problematic because that end user may lack the proper discipline, may lack the proper uh, training to do it correctly. And so if we can switch and, and move that task to machine learning, we can build machine learning models that can automatically classify these documents 
we would have uh, much better accuracy in terms of you know, uh, classifying these documents and therefore we can protect them uh, properly. Cyber defense is one more application of uh, AI. Uh, as we build profiles of users, we can also build historical profiles of networks and, and um, uh, build a profile for what constitutes normal behavior within a network and then alert when we see abnormal incidents or, or activity. Uh, obviously, this is an area for AI, definitely, because of the sheer number and the sheer volume of uh, events that happen on a network. Uh, and so we definitely need AI here. Um, historically, there have been issues with a lot of false alerts uh, when we monitor network activity. Uh, but over time, as you know, as AI can learn, uh, over time, it should be able to identify what constitutes a false alert from what is a, a real security incident. And with that improvement, uh, perhaps we can even automate the response to the security incident that uh, the, the AI system has detected. Fraud detection is another area. We can use uh, AI here to detect um, uh, account theft or identity theft or for anti-money laundering. Malware detection is one more application. Uh, historically, we've used signatures to, uh, to detect viruses. Um, about 10 years ago, antivirus um, tool manufacturers have recognized the need to use anomaly detection to detect malware. Uh, and they've switched from the signature-based approach to the anomaly-based approach. We've seen that for the last decade. But over the last year or so, we are seeing more sophisticated uh, deep learning based models being deployed to detect malware. So that's another area for AI um, to support security. Online safety, another one. Uh, identifying online behaviors that target youth, uh, analyzing harmful content or harmful images is another application. And then disinformation detection, uh, fact checking, um, analyzing uh, synthetically generated content, um, detecting deep fakes, detecting botnets that are propagating this false uh, information. All of those are ripe areas for the use of AI. And that's just you know, a list of applications, um, but it's by no means an exhaustive list. And because of all these applications, we expect the market for cybersecurity to grow by about 23% annually uh, to $38.2 billion in sales by 2026. But as we cyber defenders are using more AI uh, to mitigate against attacks, so are the attackers. They are leveraging AI, they are weaponizing AI to conduct more and more sophisticated cyber attacks. We see that in the malware that they design. They're designing malware that can be very well hidden, a malware that is capable of mimic mimicking the behavior of trusted systems, and therefore can be concealed and can evade detection. Uh, they're also designing malware that is um, adaptable right, that, uh, that learns about the current environment it's, uh, it has been deployed in and decides, uh, you know, how to change its behavior based on that environment. Um, also, they're using uh, AI to uh, embed attack or to design attack triggers. So, for instance, um, they can um, deploy or decide that an attack or malware would only trigger if a certain event happens or uh, based on a feature of, of the application. And that feature could be either uh, related to, um, you know, voice or visual recognition or some authentication process or some identity management feature. And that gives them basically ample um, opportunity to decide when to launch an attack. So the malware can be in stealth mode and can stay in stealth mode for you know, days, months, even years uh, until the attacker decides 
to launch the attack after collecting a lot of information about what's happening in that network or in that system. Um, AI is being used in social engineering attacks. Um, if you get an email supposedly from your boss uh, with your boss's writing style, and even um, you know using some pertinent information, would you open it? Probably yes, right? Um, because you believe that that email is coming from your from your boss. Um, and researchers have shown that this could be done. Obviously, um, you know some of pieces of these social engineering attacks are being done by attackers. Um, but also researchers have shown that an entire attack end to end can be um, automated using AI. Um, this was shown uh, at the Black Hat conference two years ago, where they have used AI to um, identify the targets of the attack uh, by looking at their uh, tweets. Um, and then they have um, identified this the styles, the writing styles of those uh, targets and their um, tweeting frequency. Um, and then the AI tool has also uh, mimicked that writing style, that, that reading style and that frequency and started tweeting, um, sending tweets to their networks with malicious links. Um, and then obviously the people receiving those tweets because they believed uh, the tweets, they clicked on those links and um, downloaded malware. And they have shown that by doing so, that attack was much more um, efficient. Um, the, the, the percentages of people clicking on those links was higher than if a person was doing them. Not only that, obviously it's much more scalable because it's automated because you can impersonate uh, so many uh, victims and not just one. Um, deepfakes is another way of weaponizing AI. Um, we've seen obviously the deepfakes, um, you know, the, the videos that we thought are impacting our uh, the results of our elections, etc. But also uh, we've seen deepfakes being um, used to to launch cyber attacks. As a matter of fact, about two years ago. Um, you know, a CEO from a, uh, an energy company in Europe has received a call from what he thought was uh, his um, uh, boss. Uh, and that call basically uh, asked him to wire about 220,000 euros to a certain account, and, and he did so. But the call was actually a, from a deep faked voice um, for his boss and, you know, the they even mimic the, the accent of the boss. So we're seeing these attacks in, in the wild. Um, and then finally, uh, AI fuzzing is another way that uh, attackers or hackers are using AI to perform attacks. Um, AI fuzzing is a combination of the, you know, the traditional um, fuzzing techniques with AI to discover or identify uh, fresh vulnerabilities um, as cyber defenders could use them to identify vulnerabilities and to fix vulnerabilities in their software. So are um, hackers um, and they're using them to discover zero, zero days so that they can launch their own attacks. And they're doing so also not just for regular software and applications, but also against AI itself. So they're using AI fuzzing to discover vulnerabilities in AI systems. Um, so let me switch here to talk about some of the uh, threats that AI uh, is introducing because of its nature. And I will focus more specifically on uh, machine learning powered systems or machine learning models. This slide shows um, you know, the normal process of training a machine learning model. So you have your data, you, you, you know, you turn it into a training, uh, divide it into a training data set and a testing data set. Um, you know, the data set has all uh, features. So all these data items are turned into features with some labels if we're talking about a classification. So how that um, data item should be classified. 
and you feed them into a machine learning algorithm, you train it with that data set, and then you end up with a machine learning model that can be used um, for inference in production. Now, um, an attacker obviously can, um, can attack the model itself, right? This is similar to uh, attacking an application today, to traditional uh, software application. They can tamper with that model or steal that model. But they can also uh, tamper with the data that is fed to that model in production. Um, these are called adversarial inputs, right? They can change or modify the input to the model in a way that fools the model or forces the model to make uh, the, to provide the wrong output. But more importantly, they can also attack the training data set. Right, they can training data set or the testing data set. They can modify the features, they can modify the labels, um, they can poison, um, so to speak, that data set and compromise it. And if they do so, they eventually compromise the model itself, right? By compromising or poisoning the data set, they compromise the model. And um, we end up with a model that does not give us, that is not reliable. So that's a new attack surface that we have to deal with um, that um, ML engineers are not thinking of, right? Because they're not necessarily thinking about how to create a, a, an ML model that is secure and robust, uh, but also security analysts may not be aware of because they're accustomed to thinking about how to secure traditional uh, software and not AI powered uh, applications and systems. So to summarize, let me talk about the, the main uh, four types of attacks against AI. The first one being evasion attacks. Evasion attacks is where um, the adversary modifies the input to the model in a way that they evade detection historically, but not, not necessarily evading detection you know, it could be another use case where we're dealing with a classification um, model that's trying to predict whether it sees, you know, a stop sign or a yield sign. And so the attack here is to fool that uh, vision system into misrecognizing the stop sign and, and thinking it's a yield sign. So it's not necessarily evasion in the sense you're, you evade detection, but it's basically fooling the algorithm to, to uh, give out the wrong output. Uh, we've seen these attacks um, in the wild. Um, internally within, lab, within the Accenture labs, we have demonstrated that we can tamper with um, or fool OCR systems, for instance, into misreading, uh, or even ATMs, into misreading the amount, the payable amount written on a check uh, by just modifying a few pixels on that check and reprinting that check. Uh, we have shown that we can um, fool surveillance cameras um, so that they uh, miss uh, seeing a person uh, in front of the camera. Uh, if the person wears a certain pattern on their t-shirt or uh, you know, carry a certain you know, piece of paper that has a certain pattern. So the camera would completely miss that that person is, is out there. So they're basically hiding in plain sight. And we've seen these attacks against uh, malware uh, detection systems. Uh, we've seen them also um, uh, against um, autopilots, self-driving um, uh, self cars, autopilot systems. Uh, where some researchers have demonstrated that by just deploying three pieces of uh, white post-it notes on the street, they have fooled the autopilot system into thinking that this is a, uh, uh, a lane, right? An indicator of a lane and it changed lanes basically. So, so these attacks could have even uh, safety consequences. Um, the second type of attack is these data poisoning attacks, where the adversary basically completely modifies uh, the, um, the training data that is used to build the model. Uh, this is an attack that is prominent, especially if an organization is um, using third-party data 
to build its own machine learning models. And so they have to be aware of that type of attack. Um, the third one is uh, the model inversion attack. Uh, here, basically, uh, given a model, the adversary can reconstruct uh, an average uh, you know, uh, class uh, of that model. So, so they can reverse engineer the model, if you will. They can reconstruct a model that is very similar to the original model. Um, this is important to be aware of if that model constitutes intellectual property for the organization that they want to protect. And then finally, the, the fourth type of attack are these membership inference attacks um, where uh, sensitive information can be leaked. Um, so the attacker can infer some sensitive information about uh, the data that was used to build the model. And if that uh, data includes sensitive information about people, private information, then there's a privacy breach. So these are attacks we have to be aware of as you know people in the security community and as uh, people in the AI community, we have to mitigate uh, against these attacks, but more importantly, we have to um, build uh, AI systems that are secured by design against these attacks. So I probably don't have enough time, um, but what I want to just bring your attention to is that we need to be thinking about security from the onset as we are building these uh, machine learning models and AI powered oh. systems. We need to think about their safety, their security, their robustness, uh, but we also need to think about um, uh, holistically how to build trustworthy AI, AI that we can trust, um, so that we can deploy it. Uh, as a matter of fact, Gartner has estimated that 85% of machine learning projects fail and they don't make it into production because of all of these issues, right? Because we're not developing trustworthy AI. So to build that trust, we need the security, the robustness, the safety, et cetera. We need to make sure also that the AI or the machine learning models we develop are privacy preserving and that they are explainable. And explainable here, uh, you know, uh, is important. Explainability is important to build trust into the AI, but also to gain visibility into what's happening uh, within those ML models. How are they making decisions so that we can secure them appropriately, so that we can make them, um, we, go, we can govern them appropriately and monitor the, them over time and make sure that they are robust over time. And so with that, uh, I'll end my talk and uh, I'd love to uh, answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. That was absolutely fascinating. Let's welcome our panelists. Uh, David Erie is the Chief Technology, uh, Chief Technology Officer of the Center for Innovative Technology. Currently, he leads Smart Communities Initiative for Virginia and is helping bring this new generation of capability to all Virginians. Uh, Milos Manik is a professor with the Computer Science Department and director of VCU Cybersecurity Center at Virginia Commonwealth University. As a principal investigator for a university partner, he completed over 40 research grants with the Department of Energy, Homeland Security, Air Force, uh, VEA, uh, INL, National Science Foundation, and industry entities. In addition, he's a fellow of Commonwealth Cyber Initiative with specialty in AI and cybersecurity. Abdul Rahman is the CCI AI Testbed Director. Rahman has designed and built AI and machine learning analytic platforms to support multi-domain data fusion predictive capabilities. He led cross-functional teams of threat researchers, data scientists, and engineers to refine, improve, and develop threat directions, de threat detections. Zachary or Zach Tudor is the Associate Laboratory Director of Idaho National Laboratory's National Homeland Security Directorate. Previously, Zach was a Program Director in the Computer Science Laboratory at SRI International, where he served as a management and technical resource for operational and research and development cybersecurity programs for government, intelligence, 
and commercial projects. And our moderator is Liza Wilson Durant. Liza serves as the Associate Provost for Strategic Initiatives and Community Engagement at George Mason University and Professor and Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives and Community Engagement in the Volgeno School of Engineering. She works to build meaningful partnerships across the university with external corporate, government, academic, nonprofit, and global entities to support the mission of the strategic objectives of the university. In addition, she serves as the director of Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia Node of the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative. Liza, the panel is all yours. Hello and welcome. I'm Liza Wilson Durant, Associate Provost for Strategic Initiatives and Community Engagement at George Mason University and the director of the Northern Virginia Node of the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, also known as CCI. Uh, if you don't know, the CCI is a consortium of university, college, industry, government, economic development organizations, uh, even K through 12 and nonprofit partners who are working together to establish Virginia as an international leader in cybersecurity through collaborative investments in research, workforce development, and entrepreneurship. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today to moderate our panel on trust and assurance in AI. So as I was preparing for today's panel, uh, searching around to see you know, what folks uh, are thinking about and talking about, uh, I came across a Stephen Hawking uh, quote that said, AI could be the worst event in the history of our civilization, uh, implying of course that the impact could be catastrophic if its development is not ethically controlled uh, as well as made secure. Um, we know that AI research accelerates, machine capabilities are quickly expanding so that AI systems are becoming a part of our everyday lives. But we think it's imperative that trust and assurance mechanisms are baked into the development and deployment process. But that's hard to do as we'll discuss today. Uh, AI systems must be deemed reliable, explainable, unbiased, fair, uh, privacy preserving to be truly accepted by humans and fully integrated in society. So to address these challenges, the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative has developed a multi-institution and interdisciplinary collaborative effort to advance foundational knowledge in trust and assurance in AI systems, leveraging use inspired research questions that are presented by our partners. Um, our team and collaborators are combining their deep expertise in the convergence of AI and ML with cybersecurity, engineering, social sciences, human factors, policy, and more. So today we've assembled a panel of leaders with deep knowledge and perspective about cybersecurity challenges associated with widespread integration of AI in our daily lives and critical operations. So we'll talk about some of the major challenges and present the CCI AI testbed as a means to study and work out these challenges in real time and space and early in the development of AI based algorithms, processes and technologies. So let's begin with their introduction and let's start with Zach. Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, sure, I'm uh, Zach Tudor. I'm a CISSP. I'm the Associate Laboratory Director for National and Homeland Security Science and Technology at the Idaho National Laboratory in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Thanks for joining us. Uh, David? Yes, David Erie. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of the Center for Innovative Technology uh, here in London, uh, Virginia. Milos? Hello, uh, my name is Milos Manik. I'm Professor of Computer Science at Virginia College University. I'm Director of ECU Cybersecurity Center and one of the nine fellows of the inaugural class of fellows of CCI. I also hold the joint appointment with um, Idaho National Labs. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And Abdul. I'm Abdul Rahman. I'm a research professor at uh, Hume uh, Center for National Security uh, and Technology. And I'm also the um, director of the CCI AI testbed. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. So let's get started. Uh, Zach, as a leader at Idaho National Lab, the nation's leading center for nuclear energy on R&D. How are we leveraging AI to make infrastructure more secure? And how are we protecting these solutions from compromise? Yeah, thanks very much, Liza. Appreciate being here. And uh, yes, uh, here at I INL and, uh, and at the other national labs, um, you know, we have a uh, particular interest in uh, protecting our critical infrastructure in, in uh, many different ways. 
INL, as you mentioned, is, uh, is one of the key uh, research and development and operational centers for um, uh, critical infrastructure and cyber physical uh, R&D. Uh, so over the years, we've been developing various different types of uh, technologies involving AI and M ML, uh, including our ACES platform that uh, uses AI to detect anomalies in critical infrastructure systems, uh, but also more operationally focused um, uh, projects like um, MATER or MATTER, depending on how you call it, machine-to-machine -machine automated threat response uh, that we developed uh, in concert uh, um, with the, uh, the California Energy Security for the 21st Century Program. Uh, with uh, utilities um, in, uh, in California, you know, primarily to make sure that the, uh, the AI that uh, we're beginning to develop, that we understand its capabilities, uh, some of its uh, flaws and vulnerabilities, and, and understand how to start deploying these uh, the systems safely. Uh, but at the same time, we also realize that uh, a lot of our stakeholders, a lot of the utilities around the country will be looking uh, to us to understand what some of the potential vulnerabilities of AI may be. So we are continuing our research on the vulnerability side of AI as well, um, with focused uh, work groups of experts uh, from across the nation talking about those issues, um, and also uh, doing uh, R&D um, in, uh, in AI vulnerabilities, adversarially AI, um, ways to, to tank AIs and others. Um, and so it's critical that we understand um, how AI may be attacked uh, so we can uh, produce those uh, types of mitigations that are necessary in the future. Uh, it's kind of difficult right now. We haven't seen a lot of attacks uh, against uh, AI or ML groupings. We, we have a lot of theoretical um, uh, attacks. We're developing some prototypes that obviously we don't want to escape and give people opportunities uh, to use uh, before we're ready. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a difficult um, you know, proposition to uh, develop mitigations for a kind of a class of vulnerabilities that hasn't been exploited yet. But uh, we're working to provide those uh, secure and, and privacy preserving AI as well. So David, you've been engaged in that Stafford County Smart Community Testbed. Can you tell us a little bit about that testbed and how AI is being implemented in the testbed and what are some of the security challenges you're facing or and maybe any strategies that you're using to address them? Sure, thank you. Uh, so the, the testbed is really a pre-operational end-to-end system that we hope will uh, be a model that can be directly implemented in Stafford and other communities across the Commonwealth. And when I say end to end, that includes uh, uh, distributed Internet of Things sensors, IoT sensors. Uh, it also includes uh, communication capabilities like 5G, uh, a full up digital infrastructure, back end data handling, all the way uh, to the applications that the user communities will uh, uh, take advantage of. Uh, and certainly, there are the, the classic kinds of cybersecurity problems. Whenever you talk about uh, uh, network or data security, uh, and, and so we're clearly looking at those. Uh, we have implemented some uh, uh, VPNs and uh, zero trust uh, network kinds of uh, solutions as a starting point, and working with the vendors uh, on some of their uh, unique uh, uh, capabilities and how you how how do you secure 5G, for example. Uh, but in addition to the the technical challenges, because it's directly community facing uh, we also have uh, you know deal directly with the trust and, and the social kinds of issues and uh, many uh, a number of previous implementations around the country of smart communities uh, have really had to pull back uh, uh, when they tried to implement things like facial recognition or other capabilities without really getting that community acceptance and buy-in and so we're, we're looking at the of those dual problems, not only the technology aspects of cybersecurity, but also as we implement uh, different types of uh, AI solutions in, in this testbed, how can we uh, understand and, and be responsive uh, to community concerns like privacy? Uh, so uh, it's a very challenging problem. Thanks. Uh, and just as a, a follow up to that, have you had a lot of um, interest from the general community about the test bed and concerns about their privacy? Have you had a lot of engagement yet in that area? And, and how do you plan to work with the community in the future in that regard? Yeah, so I think um, we're, we're building up towards a, a ribbon cutting for the test bed later in, in May. And I think is as the community awareness spreads, we're starting to get an increasing amount of interaction and questions about that. Uh, you know, I think the uh, 
the, the direct response is really be transparent about what we're doing, to invite the community in, to ask what those concerns are and, and what kinds of things might be acceptable. Uh, you know, it's clearly not a good strategy to implement first and ask questions later. So we're, uh, and, and I think the other aspect of that is, is, you know, many people are still trying to understand what, what are this set of technologies, uh, not only AI and ML, but, but uh, smart communities, IoT type of technologies more generally. Uh, so the messaging around, uh, here's what these technologies are, here's how they can benefit you in your daily life is really critical. Thanks. So, so Milos, what happens when AI makes a mistake in the context of critical infrastructure or even autonomous vehicles, for example? What kinds of safeguards and strategies are being developed to address that? Thank you, Eliza. This is an interesting question, and it, it, it has a number of questions behind. So we are all aware of the trolley problem. Um, would you decide to kill one person in order to save another five? How do you define the metrics of morality, of ethics? How do you quantify these, these entities? Um, and also, where is the trust in, in AI when given um, uh, a mandate to make decisions on, on somebody else's lives? Uh, we that work on algorithms, working in trenches on algorithms and data, we, we tend to uh, believe that our algorithms are perfect and, and able to make decisions in previously unseen scenarios. But it, the question is really how well has our algorithm been trained and has the data that was given to algorithm uh, fair? Is that data unbiased? Is that data uh, trusted um, and so on? Uh, so it's it's very difficult to to uh, deal with all these issues, and we in CCI work on a number of problems relative to these questions. Uh, very early on, at the beginning of, of of CCI whole initiative, we put together a proposal on trustworthy AI, uh, National Institute on Trustworthy AI, which demonstrated the um, capacity and knowledge of Virginia in this field. So we addressed various aspects from explainable AI, fair and biased, privacy preserving, reliable, verifiable, all the way to policy and governance. And while putting these, these items together, we realized how much work there is yet to be done. Um, so we keep on going um, and trusting that our algorithms will do better in future as, as we um, produce more more research in this arena. Thanks, and, and Abdul, just building on what's been discussed already, one of the great challenges of Securize systems is the integrity of the training data and the validation of the system. Can you discuss some of the challenges and the impact of the so-called dirty data? I know you're an expert on this. Um. Well, I have a little bit more of an extreme view than a lot of people. So to build on what Milo said, uh, outside of uh, classwork and in academic settings where you're, where you're learning things um, in a classroom, a, a lot of the data sets that you obtain and want to build models over are dirty. They're sparse. Um, it, it has a lot of omissions. Um, it has a lot of data that's malformed. And so the idea in a lot of work that you know, we're trying to get to or, or stabilize on to, to go from manual to semi-automatic to automatic is to um, build models and train them and test them in a way where they have good accuracy and precision. And part of the life cycle that you have to go through in training data and testing it, uh, training models and, and, and testing them over data is to observe if there's been any omissions uh, or if there's been any, you know, bad data within them, which that process to to straighten that out is called imputation, and and a lot of these processes initially have to be done in a manual way, but we want to train algorithms uh, in a way to improve our data so that we can build algorithms for, for real AI, and and part of the challenges that that we see is uh, many of the data sets that we get are are not necessarily structured or unstructured, but they semi-structured. 
Uh, there, there may be uh, language obtained there that's uh, misspellings uh, along with data that's been, uh, you know, miscategorized or misplaced. And so part of what we're trying to do is, you know, obtain data sets where real models can be built uh, with the kind of accuracy where predictions can be made, which is truly what AI is trying to do. So as you build an algorithm and you develop it and you utilize a training set, that training set has to be of a certain quality uh, because really it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you build a model that has uh, poor quality data, you're going to get poor predictions. Uh, so the idea overall in general is to formalize a way where you can build a pipeline uh, to support uh, data and, and its um, healthy um, you know, ecosystem and life cycle so that the predictions that you get out of it, uh, number one, can give you the kinds of values that you're looking for, but as you release it into the wild and deploy it, when you go to retrain it, you can improve on the accuracy and precision and not go downward. Eliza, I want to you know kind of comment on that also. You know, one of the things that that we see um, as we've been working on, uh, say, um, AI-based uh, anomaly detection for uh, information technology systems, is a lot of the uh, initial training data. If you wanted to to represent reality, you try to take uh, snapshots uh, from existing systems. And as we've seen, uh, say with SolarWinds or others, many systems are compromised for you know days, weeks, or months uh, without uh, really knowing. And so you could grab a data set. Uh, that actually has uh, adversarial uh, activity in it uh, and train an AI that uh, that's um, a, a good training set, a normal training set. Uh, so, you know, we also need to find ways to make sure that that we have a, uh, a good representative uh, data source, not only in, in IT systems, but also in critical infrastructure systems. And that brings the problem back to how do we know that there's not adversarial activity going on at the time, um, you know, if we could... Uh, you know, uh, justify that, then uh, we, we've already done uh, most of the job that we want the AI to help us with uh, in the future. So so it, it, it's uh, very cyclical as we learn how to um, build better models that can represent reality um, uh, with to the fidelity that uh, we can then do it uh, with a, a predictive accuracy, you know, later on without using real training data. I, I'd like to build on that if possible, um, or just to comment that, uh, from an adversarial perspective, there is, there is a portion of machine learning called adversarial machine learning or AML, where an adversary will go in and he will do his work really, really hard to poison the, the training or test data set. And a lot of what we're doing in, in data science and machine learning and AI is the, the primary goal is to reduce or remove bias. Uh, the reality is we never can totally remove bias, but we can understand its sources to compensate. An adversary would come in and inject uh, types of behaviors into um, the system, into the agent, and that would in turn cause a uh, data set to be gathered with this kind of bias. And so as you go to train your algorithm or retrain your algorithm, what you end up with is the tendency to score results in the manner in which your training set or testing set has been in biased. And so when now you release that into the real world, whenever you see an actual um, example of this through a sensor where you're receiving a feed and you're scoring against real data, that bias will actually be projected into your prediction and it will be what, you know, it, it, it won't be valid. And so a lot of the times the way that, you know, systems that have the kind of AI in it that can do these automated predictions like like Zach mentioned have this you know in a have great AI but they're not uh, hardened against the adversarial machine learning so this is another uh, aspect of, of building AI in a way that it can be assured right because the overall topic that we're really trying to get to is the deployment of AI to know that it's actually making the predictions that that we, we anticipated I'd, I'd like to build on that I, I think Zach and and Abdul are, are, are hitting the right questions here. Um, but even before we went to um, adversarial networks and, and nefarious part of, 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 of AI, for many years, for decades, we've been trying to perfect our algorithms to do the modeling correctly. In other words, to provide correct outputs for certain inputs. And 
in recent years, we got to a point where our algorithm is so powerful. They can, we can use a number of different algorithms that will all perform um, uh, very well, if, if not almost perfect. And then the question becomes, does the algorithm make the right decision for right reasons? In other words, is it looking at right features of a problem to make a right decision in the end? And this is where we are starting to resemble uh, or algorithms starting to resemble us because all the algorithms in a way start becoming subjective in a way because they're looking at, at parameters that are closer to the algorithm. And I will say in the old times, even with traditional unsupervised, so-called unsupervised learning, even then the, the, the operator, the humans were inputting some parameters and ignoring that those parameters are, are given by human. What happens in, in, in essence is that we are biasing the algorithm by providing certain values for those, those parameters. So this has always been the issue, just getting a bigger of issue because the algorithms are more powerful, more difficult to understand. And, and now we are even more retroactively addressing this. But I will mention another thing, uh, human factors, we always had a, a notion of introducing human in, in, in a loop. And at the time, it was time of expert systems where these are rule-based systems. But today, in the last five, six years, the, the whole approach with physics enhanced data-driven is, is keeping us real in a way, but by no means is, is, a, is a solution to a problem. Thank you. Back to you, Liza. Yeah, and, and Liza, I'll, I'll just jump in one more time, and, and Milos knows this. You know, I, I like to um, liken, uh, you know, training your, your AI to, to training uh, your, your child, and they go through uh, several stages. Uh, but also, um, for all the training that, that parents give their uh, their kids, every now and then they'll come back and and um, the, uh, perform the behavior, and you wonder where did you learn that, right? And then you have to do some reinforcement learning, we would call it here, <laughs> from retraining. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to look at uh, as well as we go forward, um, the continual training or, or revalidating of the AIs as they go forward to ensure that some of the tainted uh, data that Abdul talked about um, hasn't uh, you know, changed our expected outcomes. Well, thank you so much. Now, uh, Abdul, I wanna ask you, can you talk a little bit about what CCI is doing to help build trust and assurance in AI systems? And I'm gonna let you share your screen so you can kind of walk us through what CCI has been working on in the last year. Sure. Um, let's see, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, um, I'm the director of the CCI AI testbed and I'm working in, with my colleagues uh, within CCI. Um, and we, the state of Virginia has made an investment a large investment in both a, a 5G testbed and an AI testbed. And we are within our first year uh, right now, um, fiscal year, where we have built out uh, an infrastructure, stood up capabilities, stood up a team and some process, and have actually produced some interesting results uh, on the testbed. And I'd like to talk a little bit about it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the mission, the vision and objectives, uh, some of the tenets and requirements, uh, the infrastructure, uh, the usage, and uh, the model. And really, this is all in the vein of supporting uh, the building out and formation of um, analytics, data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence that can support, uh, in large part, cybersecurity research for CCI, but uh, for other studies um, that uh, have applicability um, th there is opportunity to continue to, to work to build algorithms to support those use cases as well uh, if, if you're within CCI. So the vision for the testbed is to uh, stand up an ecosystem uh, to support uh, a variety of different cyber-related research um, and to support education uh, and for the Commonwealth. And it's really to position the Commonwealth as a world leader in cybersecurity. Um, the, the mission is really for the testbed is to be an engine for research and commercialization of next gen cyber technologies. Uh, and the, the idea is how do we continue to expand the need for, for a growing workforce utilizing cyber with AI, ML, and data science. Uh, 
So the test bed serves as, as an engine to do that. Um, and uh, we have some desire and, and need to make the test bed accessible to researchers within CCI to use it for their studies, uh, to support world-class research, and to continue uh, pushing uh, our desire to, to be recognized uh, as, as uh, top in class for this kind of research. Uh, the, the test bed is supported by this hub and spoke model. Um, and essentially, Virginia Tech uh, within you know, the Northern Virginia area, um, where the equipment, uh, the infrastructure is located, uh, supports a federated login for all of the other nodes uh, that participate within CCI. And the goal of the testbed is to serve as a secure multi-tenant capability uh, for a variety of different uh, AI and ML workloads that can be uniquely divided into graphical processing unit and central processing unit um, capabilities. So different users with different needs come to the testbed to train, test, validate, uh, and may at times you know, deploy their algorithms um, against a workload that they may have developed uh, internal to their local clusters. Um, the test bed is centrally managed uh, and there's a staff that supports Monday through Friday, um, nine to five. Uh, the hardware today has been refreshed. Um, on the far right is a picture of our current DGX2 infrastructure, um, which consists of about 1.5 terabytes of RAM uh, has 16 GPUs, and it's been refreshed recently uh, with the addition of two A100s. This is all NVIDIA hardware. Uh, right now, today, the test bed serves about 100 users with a concurrency of about 20 to 30 users uh, for all of the uh, state universities within uh, Virginia, universities and colleges. Um, and the goal is here to stand up and continue to maintain this um, secure multi-tenant environment uh, to support all the users uh, for all of their various computational needs. Our tenants to support the test bed uh, over this past year, as I've mentioned, is secure multi-tenancy and, and support a variety of different data. So we have a data catalog um, that is uh, stood up and really semi-automatic in a way where you can launch a request to bring on a new data set to the test bed. And through uh, our current processes, we're able to pull that uh, data set, uh, stage it on the test bed and really catalog it so that other users that may have a need for these data sets could um, utilize it in different ways. Uh, so that's one of the advantages of using the test bed is that we can support this data cataloging uh, and for quick lookup along with we, we have Git repos uh, repositories to support the code for various algorithms and development. Um, we focus on automation, scalability, and integration and innovation. And one of the key things that's a differentiator within our test bed is we've built a community. Um, right now, it's presently in Microsoft Teams, but we're evolving into the Open Data Hub so that we can lower the barrier to entry so that many different um, users can actually make use of the test bed very, very quickly. And some of the requirements that many of our users have levied on us are on the far right. I won't read them, uh, but they're, they're pretty wide and pretty deep. Um, our tenants and goals really come across four main veins. Our primary focus is to produce publishable research or to facilitate and enable that with uh, the test bed users. It's also to produce this a networking and collaboration environment where we can promote code reuse, uh, experiment, reproducibility, and have researchers network amongst themselves. In addition, the testbed can serve as an educational forum um, where experiential learning tutorials can be formed. And finally, you know, the sponsorship and commercialization aspect can't be understated, where we're looking to uh, write proposals uh, and uh, push those out so that we can get additional funding. So all four of these are really um, four legs of the stool that we're looking to uh, stand up and maintain. Our infrastructure is based on Red Hat in production utilizing OpenShift. And this is an example recently where we've leveraged Kubernetes uh, through OpenShift 
to support containerization and orchestration and the standup of different uh, CCI user environments with their base quota. And this base quota consists today of one terabyte of storage um, and uh, about 256 gigs of RAM. Uh, it can be increased uh, for each uh, particular worker, uh, but today um, we've we've established that different users with different profiles come in, but we, we've, we've established sort of a baseline of, of the way to do this. And we, we have um, uh, Docker containers and Helm charts that can continue to automate this and roll this out. So it's uh, almost seamless. So if a user comes in with, a, it's created an account, we can uh, provision uh, an infrastructure for them with their container and they will be able to get to a Jupyter notebook and be able to run their experiments. Let's see here. Uh, an example of the kinds of processes that we can run to support data analytics um, is, you know, exhibited here. This is an example of a process uh, that we uh, highlighted to uh, a CCI community group that were studying, uh, that, that had a desire to build out a cataloging system for biological molecules. And so they wanted to know ways in which they could deploy a uh, AI or ML pipeline to support their project. And so this type of pipeline is, is an example. We, we don't standardize on a pipeline. We provide platform as a service um, with a certain level of support, with a certain level of tools. So in this example, you could within the test bed, build your own analytics process similar to this, where you basically support data preparation, as I mentioned before, you take data, you cleanse it, you perform what's called exploratory data analysis or EDA to understand what's in the data. You visualize it to determine if there are any omissions or, or you need to pr perform imputation. You perform the technique on it, which could be classification or clustering. You make your prediction and then you, you embed this into a capability where you can actually perform iterative or automatic predictions on things. And then you continually to train uh, and test your algorithm. And this is the kind of process that you know, can be run on the test bed. Again, we don't stand up a process. We don't mandate that people use a process, but these can in general be very beneficial for um, large scale data sets or wanting to do things in an automatic way. Some of the operational vision um, that we'd like to get to is to be able to take uh, at the bottom left, uh, a traditional development workflow like dev, QA and UAT to production and be able to embed a, a data science life cycle where you're taking an idea or a concept you're building a model, you're performing your exploratory data analysis, you're taking your candidate model and you're basically injecting into your app predictions. And these types of predictions and this kinds of workflow are, are very unique to a test bed, but we, we have the hardware and the infrastructure, the compute and the processing to support this. So this is just an example of a, a 2B state, depending upon project and application where things, are, uh, where things could uh, proceed in this way. Our roadmap we start with in our monthly meeting to the user group is uh, going over our yearly roadmap here, which basically is divided and color coded. The top four align to what I mentioned previously, research thrusts, which is the typical on-ramp for CCI users. Um, and some of these users will be participating in the AI marketplace where AI capabilities, uh, the data sets along with their algorithms will be available there. Uh, educational modules for the portal and experiential learning modules, along with the ability to uh, expand and enhance the ability to do workforce development uh, is, is part of uh, what we're looking for in the later quarters and obviously helping to support sponsorship and proposals. I spend a lot of my time in the green portion, which is standing up the test bed, and we use this to be transparent with our user base to let them know the kinds of activities that um, we have underway uh, presently. Our hardware user and compute and memory footprint is all the way on the left. And as we extend toward in, in time toward the right, you can see how we're evolving things. So prior to our hardware refresh, where we just had a DGX2 supporting 80 to 100 users with 24 cores, we did a refresh and added two A100s and we, we you know, immediately were able to add GPU processing. And so more GPUs obviously 
gets to the place where we can support more sophisticated workloads. But the key idea is for us to expand in our year two and our year three. Um, and in, by the end of this year, we're looking to have 200 users with a concurrency of about 20% or 40 concurrent users um, with our compute and, and memory footprint as we have it here. Uh, again, you know, we, we support three modes of operating and, and three main goals. We want to produce high-level user interfaces. We want to make DevOps available to the user base, and we want to use state-of-the-art hardware. And right now, this is really an on-prem cloud infrastructure supporting the CCI community with an opportunity to extend uh, in, in other places, in particular the public cloud. Uh, our goal is to stand up this open data hub, uh, and, and we're making good strides in, in this way. Our offerings uh, on the far right, as I mentioned, some of the solutions and some of the services uh, along with some of the vehicles. Really what we're, we're trying to do as much as we can is to enable the test bed to be used as a tool to get users running uh, as fast as possible. So this is something that we have you know, been uh, arduously working toward and been, you know, working pretty hard to make sure that the test bed is accessible and that uh, onboarding an account setup is uh, very, very fast. Some of the objectives by phase, and I won't read these, uh, into the outward years really have to do with commercializing um, and engaging in more industry support and getting more external funding. And so these initial years, which are foundational to stand up this minimal viable infrastructure, uh, and we've proved out with several proofs of concept and prototypes, lead into year two to support more of CCI schools and more of their research. So this is just the high level plan of, of where we're trying to proceed to. Our usage by year five, ideally 500 faculty and staff, uh, with concurrency of about 20% or more. Um, ideally, this can be something that we're working towards uh, and as we try to you know, continue to uh, make these uh, inroads uh, to evolving and building. I wanted to highlight a little bit of our process for onboarding. Um, we have three capabilities that are available to the users. First one is a collaboration site for Teams. Um, which is our community. The second one is our repositories are in code.vt.edu. And finally is testbed access. And this testbed access is with all three of these uh, give rise to this foundational um, set of capabilities where a user can come in, get onboarded fast, uh, see the data that's available and make use of um, some of the code that's already been built against these data sets. And this is the process flow for onboarding, which is a pretty well-worn path. And we're going uh, consistently to communicate with um, many of the users and the user base out there so that support their onboarding. Some of the pilot projects already in flight today uh, by some of the researchers support a variety of different aspects within cybersecurity research. Um, and this list is growing. And as Liza is one of the directors uh, from a node perspective uh, can attest to, uh, many of the uh, members of each node uh, are wanting more access to it. And so this is growing. And so the demand for supporting uh, AI and ML for cybersecurity research, along with assuring this, these AI capabilities is uh, expanding at, a, at an alarming rate. And this is the end of my presentation. Um, and I appreciate the time. Well, thanks so much, Abdul. I think what's really exciting about the project is the fact that it's bringing so many people who are working on similar but different challenges together underneath the testbed umbrella to exchange strategies, leverage the equipment, and we're grateful for the funding from the Commonwealth. You know, in the future, um, you know, we're exploring a model where, you know, other entities could gain access um, to the testbed, non-university partners in CCI, other labs, um, and of course, uh, industry and government can always partner with the universities on projects and gain access to the testbed through those partnerships with the institutes of higher ed. Um, so if, if this testbed seems like a solution, uh, to some of the challenges that our uh, community is engaged in. I hope that you'll reach out to us and let us know. Um, you know, we have a lot of work to do to figure out how to get the most out of this incredible tool. But I wanted to ask uh, our panelists, um, how do you see leveraging the test bed in your work, uh, if you would, and the value of it? 
Thank you. Well, well I'll start, uh, Liza, you know, and, and Abdul, um, you know, great uh, presentation. Um, you know, I, I think number, you know, besides the, the hardware, the technology, the processes, um, as we build this up, Virginia will become a source of expertise for user communities around the nation and possibly around the world. Uh, you will have, uh, have learned hard lessons, um, provided uh, advice to others, and be able to be a, a core part of the, uh, the, the ongoing AI and machine learning explosion that's going to be going on uh, in, in transportation and medicine and education, et cetera. So, so I think we're on just the beginnings of, of long different sets of usage of this capability. Yeah, if I can jump in here next, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I'd really like to see the interaction be able to go both ways. Uh, certainly, as you use the test bed and, and the things that you learn, uh, you know, certainly one of the pilot projects here on your list is the uh, Smart Cities on the project. So we would like to take that learning or that understanding of that technology directly into sort of the pre operational practice. But I think also as we uh, experiment with the uh, you know, IoT kind of structures in communities, uh, we'd like to be able to use both both the expertise, you know, your uh, this great collection of, of experts and universities and so forth, uh, you know, as well as the kind of the, the technical infrastructure to help us understand issues that we, we face in those uh, kind of uh, operational domains. So really looking forward to that interaction. And I will add to that, that uh, Virginia is taking right steps in right direction on right topics. AI assurance and, and uh, is, is really the, the, the core of the future problems and future solutions. And uh, uh, similar to, I will throw in Virginia cyber range. Uh, I, I firmly believe that um, CCI's AI test bed will, will uh, not only support Virginia researchers, but it's, it's at some point very soon will be um, a nationwide test bed. Um, simply, it's 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 there's so much going on in Virginia. It is is the right place to start and and continue growing. Back to you, Liza. Well, just before we close, I want to ask one last question. Uh, anyone can comment on this. Um, a lot of the audience and, and community around NVTC are very concerned about future workforce challenges. And I'm wondering if you think both, are we preparing uh, folks for the future in cybersecurity and AI? And um, Abdul, you talked a little bit about the goal for leveraging the testbed for workforce development. Uh, how do you see the testbed serving that and how can we communicate about that to our NVTC community? I think there's um, some major muscle movements that have to occur with embedding learning, reasoning, and development of, of capabilities such as this, and the whole workflow and life cycle in, into what we do. Um, a, a lot of cybersecurity involves utilizing vendor tools, and, and there's no knock on that. That, that is definitely the way that, that the world is working. But what we found is that rules-based detections are not enough. You, you need behavioral based learning as well. And, and some of that behavioral based learning comes through building, you know, machine learning algorithms that can, you know, eventually learn and understand patterns. So right from the very onset, when we look at problems within cybersecurity, um, the, we, we have to avoid this easy button and go after taking, taking some of the harder steps, right? Some of the harder steps are how do we, uh, how do we incorporate AI and ML from a workflow standpoint into rules-based capabilities and force vendor partners to do the same so that they can build open APIs that can support the kind of integration with these uh, workflows and pipelines that uh, different users are building. I mean, this is gonna be critical as we move into um, 2022 and beyond. Yeah, and Liza, I think that from, from the workforce perspective, um, we're, we're helping to build a workforce of the future, not just those who are going to be um, uh, de designing and deploying AI systems, but those who are going to be using those systems to develop new smart cities, new methods of transportation, um, you know, new methods of uh, you know, searching for uh, natural resources, uh, but also the, the next end user community as well, because um, the, the people that use those at the end are going to have to understand 
the capabilities and limitations of AI, how to operate them. There'll be fewer human operators, but they will be operating um, a large number of new types of artificial intelligence um, in every realm that we're in. And I think we're at the forefront of helping the workforce transition uh, to this new uh, automated environment, um, both here in Virginia, but across the nation. I'd like to you know, echo Zach's comments there. You know, I, I think uh, if we look at, say, cybersecurity in general, we have a, a few developers, a larger number of system administrators, and yet we're training the entire workforce on how to, how to pay attention to cybersecurity issues. And I think as we move AI increasingly into, into operation into the world, that same thing will hold through. You know, the people uh, at the community level who are making decisions about how to invest tax dollars or what to implement for their communities need to have some level of understanding as well what what they're looking at how, how to utilize that uh, to the benefit of the population at large. And I will add to that as specifically what Zach was saying uh, these two topics of AI and cybersecurity are so intertwined and there's there's no way around it but um, we cannot view workforce development in terms of just academia. It needs to be tied to real problems, uh, real issues. It needs to be con put in context of, of, of where the problems are, really are. And that's how we're gonna first bring the benefits of AI, then sharpen our skills and, and try to avoid um, some other unwanted, unwanted um, consequences of introduction of AI, and ultimately uh, bring the, this holy grail of, of trust, of trustworthy AI, because if we don't understand it, if we don't see it act in right way, in right problems, we're not gonna build trust, we're not gonna use it, or at least we're not gonna use it in right way. So it needs to be tied to real problem and it needs to be used by people in, 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 in real industry. Back to you, Liza. Thank you. And thank you all so much for participating in the panel today. I really appreciate all of the time that you spent to prepare and join us today. And I want to thank NVTC for providing the forum for us today. And we're looking forward to answering your questions. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the interesting panel. Next, Dr. Nancy Grady, a Chief, Chief Data Scientist at SEIC, will present a tech talk on cyber as the new Cold War and AI in the arms race. Nancy is the Chief Data Scientist and Solution Architect at SEIC in the cyber operations practice with 35 years of experience specializing in the application of machine learning, tech, machine learning techniques for data and text, text analytics systems. She leads the development of gray-red cyberspace intelligence solutions and merging cyber and electro, electromagnetic domains for situational awareness. Please welcome Nancy Grady. Welcome, my name is Nancy Grady. I'm a Chief Data Scientist at SEIC in the Cyber Operations. And my premise for the talk today is that cyber is the new Cold War and AI is the new arms race. So first I'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence as an arms race, and then of course cybersecurity is the Cold War, and then see where the focus is for AI in the cyber uh, domain, and then look at a few recommendations. Everyone has their chart on artificial intelligence, and so this is mine. Um, and when AlphaZero came out, I created this chart to talk about the advancement of AI in games and thinking, well, like the old Mariner's March uh, maps, who knew what was coming after maybe role-playing games. But in fact, in 2020, a DARPA had a virtual dogfight uh, in which the AI, in fact, won. We also have AIs used for generating content. We're used to AIs being able to generate news articles, for example, but as you can see here, uh, the advancement in generating realistic looking faces, uh, and in fact, the deep fakes that you can find uh, where uh, various famous people are made to say things that they did not actually say. So taking a look at AI, um, this is a bit of a busy chart, but you can see that in artificial intelligence, we started out uh, with very straightforward statistics, things that we could program. We knew exactly what we wanted, and so software development let us do that. Uh, as we progressed in the 90s, we moved up into data mining, where we set up the problem. We knew what we wanted, uh, but we didn't know how to deterministically do the answer, so we used probabilistic techniques. 
uh, to say do classification or do prediction based on past events. And what we're talking about is sort of a next step where the machine is trying to do uh, itself the learning needed and find out things that we didn't even know to ask it. So if you look at the bottom right of this chart, you'll see the a bit of a simplistic difference is that in machine learning, you tend to, to extract the features yourself through experts, uh, set up the problem and then let the machine give you the answer. Whereas in artificial intelligence, very often we're asking it from start to finish to be able to do that. And I would be remiss as a data scientist to not point out that there's tremendous controversy uh, that data, more data can actually beat better algorithms. So thinking about this as an arms race, uh, if you take a look at the publications, you can see of the top 10 universities, China leads in the top eight. Uh, if you wanna take a look at the book by Kai-Fu Li on AI superpowers, you'll see a distinction between the way China is approaching AI and the US. So the US is focused very much on research, but in AI on the commercial side, it's very much more into applications. And in fact, in the government, uh, post-World War II era, we expected the government was funding the bulk of all science, but now, in fact, a lot of the AI development is being done in the commercial sector. There's a tremendous amount of activity in the ISO Artificial Intelligence Committee. They're working on about 31 documents, and there are about that many countries that are participating. It's a very active group. If you're interested in more of the conceptual theoretical underpinnings, I would recommend uh, the now classic book by Pedro Domingos uh, on the master algorithm. So let's take a look, switch gears to cybersecurity. Um, so cybersecurity as a new Cold War, uh, cyber is different from our normal protection security that we do in our businesses. We lock the doors, we have a guard, and we're able to physically separate uh, other people so that, that they can't have access. But of course, cyber is global. Uh, and in fact, it's instant connection. And one of the challenges that we have going forward is the US is one of the most wired countries. And so therefore that makes us one of the most vulnerable to cyber attacks. Cyber attacks are so common now uh, that they almost don't make the news anymore. Uh, we see ransomware attacks, DDoS, malware, data breaches all of the time. Uh, the notable uh, attacks that have happened was Stuxnet back in 2010, where you can see that the cyber is connected to the physical. If you look at the Russian activity in Estonia, Ukraine, and Georgia, uh, you can see that cyber is a way of implementing their foreign policy in, in many cases to create discord uh, prior, in fact, to an invasion uh, physically. And it's also a fact that the nation state is supporting the criminal enterprise of the hackers as long as they don't hack Mother Russia. Uh, and then they're using a lot of off-the-shelf tools. So it's a very interesting dynamic. And of course, we're all familiar with the recent SolarWinds attack. If you're interested in, in seeing how all these attacks have progressed and the state of the art and abilities in hacking uh, and the history of zero-day attacks, uh, the book by Nicole Perlroth is very interesting. And in fact, uh, in many ways, rather scary by laying all of this stuff out in order and to see uh, one after the other, the magnitude of the, of the attacks and this ability. So thinking about the targets for these attacks in the Cold War, of course you want intellectual property. Uh, we've been aware that the Chinese have been stealing IP in this country for years, uh, but in the book by uh, Singer and Cole on Ghost Fleet, they actually had an interesting premise. So in the past, the theft was so that they could build the same aircraft uh, fighter that we have, but the premise is what if they're now just looking to see how to disrupt communications? And so in that book, uh, if you're in a ship and you can't communicate with your ship, you can't communicate with your missiles or your aircraft, uh, then the war is basically over. So it's a very interesting premise. We're also seeing a lot of uh, banking activity. And so nation states such as North Korea are using cyber attacks uh, to uh, attack banks uh, and take money back so that they can support uh, their military activities. And the GPS satellites that we have are, have come under attack so much these days that in fact, uh, they're starting to figure out how are we going to do without GPS satellites just in case. So one of the challenges here is that offense is way ahead of defense in cyber. Um, the government promotes and funds the offense because we want to be able to reach information that our country needs. Uh, but companies that are well, that are wired and well-connected, uh, they're sort of left to their own devices for defense. 
So I want to make an argument, thinking of the two of these, that in fact, cyber is a field of data science. So we really think initially of the micro view. We're looking at this router. Uh, we're looking at, at a break into this piece of software. Uh, but that's the small scale. Uh, but at a macroscopic level, uh, there's a lot of data that's flowing around. And so all of the data about the sensors and, and the behavior and what's happening in all of our networks and systems uh, makes this a legitimate field of data science. And so if you think about big data, the four Vs in, in the NIST document uh, matter for your architecture uh, choices, but in fact, the four Cs are the ones uh, that are useful when you're starting to talk about doing analysis of that data. And there is a convergence between the data intensive computing of big data analytics and the compute intensive coming from the high performance computing. So they're trying to sort of meet there in the middle where problems now require both. And so as a field of data science, uh, there's a tremendous amount of data. All of the sensor logs that are flowing from your networks, from your devices, uh, things that are coming from cameras in your area, uh, things, in fact, even in social media, and particularly in the dark web, provides a lot of information of what's going on. So this is amenable to the normal data science process. Uh, and in fact, in this diagram that we have, you also want to progress by looking at phase one, the most straightforward, phase two, start to do the, some analytics as you can, and then look forward to phase three to do AI. So there are times when you need to go straight to AI, but you want to progress forward and, and use the the right technique uh, to get what you need to know. And so the kinds of unknowns that you're looking for, of course, are activity alerts and, and trying to find those patterns in the data. So there's an aspect of AI um, that actually is called adversarial AI that also needs attention. And so we mentioned the generative deep fakes before, uh, but in fact, the AI models themselves are also have a large cyber component that needs to be considered. So you can break AI models by either giving them insufficient data so they never trained properly in the first place. Um, and that is quite uh, evident when you start to look at facial recognition. It simply doesn't do as well with women and minorities. Uh, you can do adversarial examples. So you could perhaps poison the data that the models are being trained on. Uh, and there's an example in 2018 uh, Google began to notice that, that a lot of scammers uh, were going in and creating Gmail accounts. And so as they generated all of their spam, uh, they marked it themselves as being legitimate email trying to influence uh, Google's models. And in terms of malware, uh, there are uh, code that allow you to check uh, a particular piece of code to see if it might be a virus or malware. But then, of course, the bad guys can use that to make sure that they would not be detected. They can build their code so they would not be. You can tamper with the models either by breaking in and, and changing the software configuration, or you could just simply red team it and see how it behaves from the other end and then figure out ways that you could be able to uh, cause the performance to degrade. And of course, there's the examples of just being able to simply disguise the data that it, AI is trying to then uh, operate on. So a panda plus some noise uh, equals a given. Uh, there's examples of putting stickers on stop signs so they no longer work, which is kind of disconcerting for self-driving cars. And then, of course, very, people are being very creative to try to fool facial recognition. So let's uh, take a look at where cyber uh, has an impact in AI. And so if you think of traditional cybersecurity, of course, we need to monitor our networks, uh, our buildings, uh, video cameras in the areas, radios, 5G cell towers, et cetera. So there's a tremendous amount of activity uh, that can use that processing to determine uh, what is the activity within all of those signals. We, of course, want to automate our defenses, uh, whether you want to try to recognize uh, the pattern of activity in malware or detect insider threat. An insider threat tends to be a challenge because, in fact, there may already be activity within the data that you're training on. And so you have to have a method that will be able to train and detect that even though it's in the presence of the training data. Uh, penetration testing, a lot of automation is used to scan ports, uh, et cetera, on the attacking side, and, and we need the same thing so we can be able to test and protect our systems. There's a lot of activity. Most of our focus is inside our perimeter, but in fact, outside the perimeter, there's a tremendous amount of activity out in the open internet. And so the challenge there is to try to figure out at a larger scale, is there like a router outage in the area or is it potentially a botnet attack? 
And so being able to analyze that very large, noisy, very fast changing data uh, is quite the challenge. And of course, you want to use that to identify threats, understand their techniques, uh, analyze the analysis, scan the dark web, uh, et cetera, and be able to figure out automated ways that you can uh, be able to mitigate the attacks as you find them since everything happens at internet speed. So on the military side uh, for cyber operations, of course, there's tremendous amount of data in the military intelligence, all of the signals that, that we don't have time to, to sift through ourselves uh, needs the artificial intelligence to find uh, useful and important items within all of that data. And sometimes it needs to be looking at the raw signal and tell you, okay, well, this is this radio of this type. And then other times it needs to say, well, let me look at the features of that radio to make sure that it in fact is what it looks like uh, and is not being uh, spoofed uh, by an adversary. And of course, sensors are used for hunting. Uh, we want to find that activity, uh, whether it's in radios, 5G or satellites. Um, but we also want to put all of this AI computing very much on the edge so that right next to the sensor, that data is also being analyzed. You don't have to wait for the time to go back be analyzed you know, in a headquarters and then come back. And so edge computing will be very important. And of course, adversarial AI in a military context uh, will become very important. And really it's all about decision-making. Um, and so in the US, of course, we require the human in the loop. Uh, that's not true of all countries, but we really need to make sure that we have this sort of augmenting analytics that processes all of this information, brings attention to the things that matter so decisions can be made faster. And so taking a look at, at this, uh, cyber is the Cold War and AI is the new arms race. Um, so how do we approach this and, and what can we do? And so the big thing, of course, is that it's all about the data. Um, we tend to focus on the software that builds certain applications. Um, and then when that application is done, we sort of let it go. But in fact, the data generated by that application could potentially be useful to someone else. Um, and so it's important that we maintain the data as a valuable resource so that it can be repurposed and reused in other things. Uh, since data can outlive its creators, we also need to have uh, semantic descriptions or an ontology to describe all of that data so it does become useful later. We do want to think about the outcomes. Um, so not only how fast or how accurate does a model have to be, but in fact, where is it supposed to run? <clears throat> how much compute power uh, do I have available? For example, if I need to run it on sensors that are you know, outside my building um, and do the computation right there at the sensor and only send me back the things that matter. So the real gap from a military point of view is just the execution. So we're very good at research, although researchers always need more realistic data, uh, but we have a little bit of a gap before we can actually get it and get it deployed. Um, and since this is computer generated code, uh, it's a challenge for us in terms of testing and how do we understand how well it performs and are we ready for it to perform. And then of course we have to remember that in AI, it's not just about uh, the accuracy or performance of the models themselves, but we need to pay a lot more attention to how easy they are to break. Uh, and so if we're going to deploy these AI models in cyber, uh, then we need to have confidence uh, that in fact, they won't be vulnerable uh, to attack themselves. And of course, a couple of examples uh, from the Department of Defense and the National Security Commission on AI. And so the final thing is just to remember that as AI is analyzing the data, uh, that needs to be its own process managed, uh, evaluated, uh, analyzed, in addition to the DevOps uh, cycle uh, that we're using to build things. So with this, I wish you well in, uh, in your endeavors in trying to figure out how we can best apply AI uh, to all our advantage. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Now we're going to take questions from the audience. We have several of our speakers on with us today to answer them. 